The topic of my presentation is um, update on uh, dystonia, the basics and the advances. I am speaking on medical management because Dr. Patel will have the most exciting talk on the surgical management, and that's where we've made tremendous uh, advances. So with that said, the objective uh, of my talk is to provide the overview of the clinical manifestations of dystonias, discuss management, pharmacological against surgical will be left out. And with that said, um, dystonia is not a new condition. Dystonia was first described by Dr. Oppenheim in 1890s. And similar to Parkinson's disease, he made his very accurate description of the syndrome. And I stress, it is the complex of the symptoms. Dystonia is not a diagnosis. As majority of you know, there is a number of conditions under that big umbrella. He made his description very accurate description based on observation of four patients. And I have to say that we kept his descriptive classification of dystonias up until very recently, and this uh, reference is to the revised classification of dystonia that was published in 2013. So what is the definition of dystonia for the basics? It's sustained or intermittent muscle contraction causing abnormal, often repetitive movements and abnormal postures. Dystonic movements are typically patterned, twisting, and may be tremulous, often initiated or worsened by voluntary movements. So this is a revised description, and as as you can see, compared for those of you who have seen these slides before, what was taken out of it, first of all, torsion dystonia was taken out to recognize that that's not the only clinical phenomenology of the clinical uh, symptoms, and gave more descriptive terminology, added tremulous movement to it with recognition that a lot of dystonias can be associated with that dystonic trauma as the clinical manifestations, and how come common is uh, dystonia. For those of you who live with it, you probably well know that it is not a common condition. So the prevalence, a prevalence means the number of people living with the condition cross-sectionally. So pre the prevalence in the United States is estimated to be a quarter of a million people. So rare, but not that rare condition. One in 3,000 incidents. Incidents is new cases. And focal dystonia is definitely a more common than generalized dystonias, 300 per million, nine, time, nine times more common than generalized. Out of focal dystonias, cervical dystonia is the most common, followed by blepharospasm. There is some notion in the literature that writer's cramp, which is the hand goal directed dystonia probably is more common but less recognized condition but still definitely cervical dystonia is the most common type of focal dystonia that we see in our clinic, uh, clinics for uh, management and now i will walk you through the physician approach to the diagnosis of dystonia so when we see the person for the first time in our clinics what is our thought process i probably am not going to give you that much new information in that, but I think that it is useful for you as patients, family members, to really understand how do we arrive to diagnosis and what we know and what we do not uh, know. So first and foremost, it is the clinical descriptive diagnosis. So the diagnosis is based on two subsets. One of them is clinical description. The other one is etiology. What is the course, if we can identify the course? So when we go through the clinical descriptors of dystonia, we do very much visual observational diagnosis. We divide the dystonias into generalized, which means obviously multiple parts of the body are involved. Segmental dystonia means two consecutive body parts, for example, dystonia involving the neck and uh, the arm. Multifocal, it is more than one, but not connected anatomically, neck and the leg, for example. Focal dystonia is obviously one particular body part, and as I have said, the most common type of dystonia. Hemidystonia, that means that it affects 
one side of the body. And when that happens, it is very important notion for physician to recognize because that's where we have to be keen to be looking for a particular lesion because the body is, God has created us symmetrically, right? And when something happens on one side of the body and doesn't happen on the other side of the body, that means that probably something happened to that part of the brain and the brain works crisscross to cause those symptoms. So these are the patients in whom we very methodically look into underlying structural lesions. Something happened around the birth of the child. Something happened before the birth, during the prenatal uh, period. So that's where the significance of identifying that half of the body distribution of the dystonic symptoms. So that is the description by distribution, right? Very basic, very any of you can look at the person and make that discrimination. The next one is by age of onset. And I will not go into the specifics young age, uh, young child, uh, older child onset, adolescence, but I will put that age of less to equal to 27 versus above. And why is that important? It is important because as of today, there haven't been cases described of a particular type of generalized dystonia caused by DYT1 our genetic course, and a lot of you are familiar with that, in the young adults above the age of 27. So it does give the physician diagnostic clue where we should be looking and whether we should do more focused genetic ascertainment or more generalized genetic ascertainment. So that's the significance of the age of onset. And then we describe by the progression of the symptoms. And again, we are collecting the points to put the puzzle together, to lead us to more definitive and more narrowed identification, what is the course. So static meaning not progressive, right? Something happened and the symptoms have never progressed uh, from then, or progressive course of the symptoms. Variability of the symptoms, you know that dystonia is very action-induced type of movement disorder. And when someone is sitting resting, there might be much less of the symptoms. And when someone starts moving, then we see the dystonic symptoms. That's the nature of our dystonia. So, and a couple terms that are important for us to recognize, action-specific dystonias. I already mentioned uh, writer's cramp, right? There is a particular type of action-induced dystonia in musicians. Uh, related to the type of instrument that uh, they're playing. I don't know whether there are any musicians in this uh, audience, but uh, pianists have been described having dystonias, and there is the whole subset of experts in the field who are focused on the management of those musicians' goal-directed uh, dystonias. We still need to have better understanding why do they develop uh, those symptoms. But again, important uh, recognition. Then diurnal dystonias is fluctuations during the course of the day. Again, very important symptoms for us to elicit because directs us to a potential underlying genetic course and what is more important to therapeutic efficacy. We'll get back to that diurnal fluctuations later, but just keep that term uh, in mind. And paroxysmal, symptoms do not happen consistently. They come in spurts, in bouts, and then go away. And again, it's important because because there is the whole category of paroxysmal movement disorders and dystonias within those paroxysmal movement disorders is a particular uh, subset. So we're still working through the physician thought process of categorizing the type of uh, dystonia. And then whether dystonia is the only neurological symptom or whether there are other conditions associated with that, again, leading to the diagnostic clues where further should we be looking for identifying uh, the course. So that are the descriptors. These are descriptors. And as I tell the students, at that point, you don't need to know much of the history about the person. You walk into the room, you obtain that focused history, you walk out and give the description of the clinical manifestations of the Estonia. Now you need to go to the next step, and that is the second part of classification. What is the underlying etiology? And the etiology is divided into three broad categories. 
At the top, as you can see, are the inherited dystonias. And probably all of you know that there has been explosion of the knowledge of the genes associated with dystonia. Explosion of the genes, still a lot to be known and to recognize what are those genes responsible for. We, get, we will get more into the discussion of the genes, but as you can see, as of at least last year, there have been 25 different genetic courses of dystonia identified, 25. And they are broadly divided into the categories of autosomal dominant, which means that if someone inherited the disease gene, no matter whether, you know that each of our genes has a pair, right? Um, no matter whether the other gene is healthy, then if you've inherited the gene, your pro, your have propensity for the disease, and depending on what is the risk of that gene to manifest as a disease, so I'm now bringing another gener genetic term of penetrance, and again, specifically for dystonias, it is a very important term to recognize, because people might carry the disease gene, but never express it as a disease in their lifetime. So that is what is called penetrance. So again, that is the definition of autosomal dominant, right? So one disease gene, the other gene not affected healthy, and people can come up with a disease, right? And these are the families where you look for presence of the disease, parent, child, grandchild, and so on. So that's vertical transmission. The next large category, what is called autosomal recessive, and probably, again, I apologize to those of you who already know those basics of genetics, but I want to bring everyone to the same baseline. So autosomal recessive means that in order to manifest the disease, the child had to inherit the disease gene, one from the parent, one from, one from each parent. And if it's just one gene, then it's not going to manifest as a disease, right? So that is autosomal recessive. The next term is X-linked, uh, uh, so carried through the X chromosome. So the mother will not manifest the disease, but if mother's gene is affected, then there is no counterpart to protect, right? Because the other gene, Y chromosome, comes from from the dead. So these are the conditions that manifest in the male children of a female individual that carries the mutation but does not manifest uh, the mutation. And then there is a term probably less familiar to you, mitochondrial genetic uh, disorders. And mitochondria is the part of the cell that is responsible for the energy of the cell, of each individual cell. So every cell has mitochondria in it, and there is a list of mitochondrial-driven conditions, and dystonia can be one of the manifestations of mitochondrial disorders. By far and the most, it will not be that clean dystonia. You remember that I, when I had one of the previous slides, uh, dystonia as an isolated symptom, or dystonia plus other neurological manifestations. So mitochondrial disorders disorders by far and the most will present with other manifestations within the spectrum of it because, again, if your energy factory is impaired, right, then multiple parts of the body can be affected by the symptoms. And that's what mitochondrial conditions are. But again, we think about them because can be associated with uh, dystonias. And then the next very large category are acquired dystonias. And acquired meaning some insult has happened and that what precipitated the symptoms. And those could be traumatic injury, definitely post-traumatic dystonias are described, have been described, vascular lesion, uh, tumor located in the strategic area of the body, some kind of toxin exposure, oxygen deprivation of the brain. So all of these conditions have been described to be associated with dystonia as a symptom. And in those cases, in the old classification, it was called acquired. Now it is the preferred term is, so again, that is the acquired, not primary dystonia. And then there is the term psychogenic dystonia. What does that mean? That means it's a very real condition. It doesn't mean that the person has psychiatric illness. 
illness, but it means that their symptoms are driven by different mechanism of quote unquote wiring of the brain and not an insignificant part of the conditions and very challenging to diagnose and difficult to treat and communicate to the patients on the other end of the spectrum. Dystonia actually, especially in the old days, was one of the conditions that had the least of diagnostic accuracy of the physician's understanding and a number of patients were sent to psychiatrists saying, you know, that is driven by psychiatric disease, you don't have the real disease because dystonias can be difficult to uh, diagnose. And then idiopathic, meaning we have not identified the course, we don't know the gene, but there is nothing else that we could have identified that has precipitated dystonias. Let's dwell a little bit more into the symptomatic courses, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on uh, this uh, slide because that is way too in detail, right? One condition that we always stress to the trainees is Wilson's disease, which is a disorder of copper um, metabolism, and the reason why it's very important to stress because it is identifiable and it is treatable. And by far and the most patients with Wilson's disease will have other type of movement disorders, returning back to that distinction of clean dystonia, nothing else found in neurological exam or other neurological manifestations, but very important entity to recognize, and I believe that any person with uh, dystonia, um, it is uh, our practice uh, parameters that he has to be screened for Wilson's disease. And again, I will skip the second bullet point because I kind of uh, went over that in the general uh, terms. So uh, let's uh, move on, and then we'll, we are continuing the discussion of etiology. What is the course of dystonia? And again, the, the separating into primary dystonias, nothing else on neurological exam or the workup, as uh, it is indicated. Childhood limb onset leads us to particular cues. What should we testing uh, for? And generalized dystonias, by far and the most, primary generalized dystonias, start in the childhood, when it starts in the adult age, we look more for the symptomatic triggering uh, courses of uh, dystonia. And now this probably doesn't project well, but this is not all-inclusive compendium of the different type of genetic mutations that have been described to be the causes of dystonia. And remember that I told you that as of at least last year, there are 25 different DYT mutations uh, described. So let's talk about the most common, and definitely DYT1 dystonia, also known as torsion dystonia, or known as Oppenheim disease, is the most common of genetic courses of uh, dystonia. So what are the characteristics of that? For those of you who live with that condition or have it in the family, I don't need to describe that, but it is childhood onset, and the age of onset can vary, usually in the our early grade school, four, age, four to six age old, but can definitely span the range, and we talked about kind of the cutoff based on at least cohorts uh, that have been collected by usually generalized autosomal dominant inheritance, remember, right, passing from one parent vertically through the next generation, and that's where the very important term of penetrance, right? Someone carries the gene but has never manifested the disease, and specifically for DYT1 mutation, it is 30% penetrant. So the fact that neither of the parents carries the disease doesn't mean that the child has not inherited the gene and the gene is not coming from the parents specifically for this type of dystonia. It does have ethnic predilection. It is more common in Ashkenazi Jewish population but not restricted to Ashkenazi Jewish uh, population and it is commercially available genetic testing. So again, remember about the clinical clues, childhood onset usually typically starts uh, from the leg, propagates into generalization, uh, looking for the family history, but lack of the fa family history does not exclude it, and uh, genetic confirmatory genetic testing is available and widely used in appropriate uh, cases. 
So the next uh, other types of dystonias that have combination of dystonic symptoms and Parkinsonian symptoms, at the top of the list is very important entity, the doper-responsive dystonia. I have another slide on that, but there are other dystonic conditions that have presence of Parkinsonian symptoms as part of it. It doesn't mean that someone carries Parkinson's disease and dystonia. It means that the person has the symptoms of both, again, those are symptoms symptoms, not diagnostic entities, and I have listed some of the genetic mutations that are associated with Parkinsonian uh, symptoms within the spectrum of uh, the presentation. So let's talk a little bit about doper-responsive dystonia because it is an important entity because he has therapeutic effective intervention. So what are the characteristics of doper-responsive dystonia? It is childhood onset dystonia, usually starts with a lower limb, so similar to the presentation of DYT1 uh, mutation. He has, in comparison, and uh, not similar to DYT1, can have Parkinsonian features, slowness, stiffness as part of their presentation, can have increased uh, reflexes. So what is very important about it and carry, carries into the name, those kids come in and say, my symptoms have been better in the morning, worse in the evening, so the rather there is that diurnal fluctuation, uneven presence of the symptoms through the course of the day of the day, what is most important therapeutically and diagnostically is that they have dramatic response to levodopa replacement therapy. Levodopa is the pro-drug of dopamine. Levodopa is the drug that is used for treatment of Parkinson's disease. Here, it's a very different reason why they respond to uh, dopamine replacement therapy. In Parkinson's disease, those cells die, and that's why we give additional dopamine. In doper-responsive dystonia, there is breakage of connection that converts precursor of dopamine into the next step. And that is breakage of connection is due to that mutation that codes for this term. I'm not even going to decipher for you, and I'm not going to quiz you on that. But what is most important is that they predictably respond to small dose of levodopa. And what it brings into the clinical importance is that any person person, specifically a child diagnosed with dystonia, will receive a therapeutic diagnostic challenge with levodopa, or you frequently would know it under the brand name of Cinemat. Carbidopa, levodopa is the way we give uh, that medication exactly for that reason. You don't want to miss it. It is DYT5 uh, dystonia. Commercial d d Genetic testing is available. The problem is that there are multiple mutations in that gene, and commercial testing captures only one of them. So for the rest of them, it's either research testing or the whole genomic sequence that we'll talk uh, in a minute. And then there is the category of paroxysmal uh, dystonias, and again, they carry specific uh, genes. I will spend less uh, time on that, but those are usually, again, the kids who will have the symptoms paroxysmally, sometimes triggered by the movement, sometimes triggered, triggered by sport activity, sometimes uh, not, and triggered by rest, on the contrary, right? So, uh, talking about the genetic testing, we already talked about the fact that it is available for DYT1 dystonias, Dystonia, obviously available for symptomatic testing when someone has the symptoms and you want to give the confirmatory diagnosis, right? It is available for asymptomatic testing of subjects at risk. So someone has history of dystonia in their family and that affected family member knows to carry the genetic mutation. And the parents want to know whether either their other kid or someone else in the family carries the gene. And that asymptomatic at-risk genetic testing should never be taken lightly, right? You are giving prediction of the risk of developing of the disease in a person who doesn't have the symptoms today. And it always, always has to be, has to be preempted by evaluation by neurologist, geneticist counseling, sometimes involvement of the psychologist, a number of uh, social issues, insurance issues have to be put in 
into the place. So again, it is available, but always in discussion, careful discussion, not just with one person, but with a team. And obviously, that's where we also get into the prenatal testing. We carry the genetic mutation, we meaning one of the parents. We are planning to start the family. We are planning to have the kids give us the risk assessment to give us the knowledge whether the fetus is carrying genetic mutation or not. It is available. Again, should be done in the center that has qualifications to put the family through the counseling and then through the testing, but it is available. Uh, we talked about DYT1 testing, that is dystonia with diurnal fluctuations, uh, and then there is this term NGS, and that is a very widely used uh, term in the medical genetic literature now. It stands for next generation sequencing. What does that mean? We'll get to that in uh, a couple of uh, seconds, but first expanding on the etiology of dystonia, right? So we talked about the clinical classification. We talked a, a little bit about the genetic underlying underpinnings of the dystonia, where we know those underpinnings, and in a number of them, we still do not. So what parts of the brain are responsible for triggering dystonia? You frequently, when you go to the doctors, you hear the term basal ganglia. So these are the structures that are located, that identified by physicians or by anatomists as basal ganglia. These are the gray nuclei, gray meaning that there is collection of the neurons uh, there, uh, localized in the central parts of the brain. This is the thalamus, this is putamen, this is globus pallidus. So these are the anatomical structures. When you look at the picture of the person with primary, quote unquote, idiopathic, we have not identified the course. The picture will look fine in majority of cases. There is more recent literature that on high resolution, very high precision scans, you might find some subtle abnormalities, but overall, majority of you were so told that MRI scan is not gonna show the course of your dystonia unless there was a trigger, right? Unless there was structural lesion, stroke, or something else, right? So it is really the wiring of the connections between these structures. And now I will show you a very scary picture. Okay, and again, I'm not gonna quiz you on that. So that is what is called the basal ganglia cortical circuitry. So think about it, is either as the engine in your car, right? How many different parts have to work in sync to produce that car moving smoothly, right? So that's what has to happen in the brain. There are activation neurotransmitters, there are inhibitory neurotransmitters, and all of them have to sync sing in sync, right? Or think about the orchestra. And someone's violin is completely out of sync, right? Doesn't sound right, right? And that's what our understanding of the mechanism of dystonia, it is really the connectivity. And Dr. Patel, when he talks about the surgical management, it actually provides to us the clues, what are the targets for the surgical intervention in dystonia. And the next, so that's what happens. This is the connectivity in the normal brain, right? And these are the connectivities in someone whose wiring has been misaligned. And in the old literature, and I'm not talking about 50 years ago, even five years ago, we were talking about low activity or high activity. More and more data is coming out that it's not really the intensity of the activity, but it is the rhythmicity of the activity, and it is the connectivity and the syncing, and syncing in sync, quote unquote. And some of the clues to that, and again, Dr. Patel, I suspect will expand on that, is uh, that we put the electrode in the same areas of the brain that we put the electrode for Parkinson's disease, right? Two separate conditions. We put the electrode in the same anatomical structures and provide benefit for both of those uh, conditions, which tells you that it's not not just too much or too little, but it is the connectivity and synchronicity and rhythmicity of the activity of these nuclei. Okay, we're done with this scary picture, right? But I thought that it's important for you to recognize the complexity of the connections, right, that are driving the uh, symptoms. And again, unfortunately, we still need to know much more of what actually is happening wrong in that connectivity of that mechanistic connection between the uh, different parts. Now 
let's get back into the clinical uh, section. And so how do you make the diagnosis? I told you first that to recognize the symptoms, you don't need to know anything about the history. You need to know a lot about the history to identify what are the potential courses and whether you can have the specific diagnostic testing of it or intervention. We usually say that 70% of diagnosis in neurology in general comes from very careful history taking. So your history is very important. Your neurological exam is very important. Depending on the history and physical exam, the physicians in majority of cases will order an MRI of the brain, and as I have said, and sometimes of the cervical spine imaging, and as I have said, in someone with primary dystonias, these scans predictably will come back as normal, nothing significant. We will order the blood tests or urine test, and we already talked about the reason for the Wilson's uh, panel. You never want to miss it. In the majority of cases, we will do diagnostic trial of levodopa. Again, not to miss the treatable condition of di dystonia with diurnal fluctuations. And then we will decide whether genetic testing is appropriate. And how do you decide uh, on the genetic testing? We talked about the genes that we can uh, test uh, for. Again, majority of these genes are not commercially available. And in a lot, and over the last five to ten years, specifically in pediatric neurology, specifically, there has been exponential growth of what is called new generation sequencing. So think about the book in which you are looking for the specific word, right? And you are scanning the book just for one word, right? Or your other alternative to have a program in your computer to scan the whole book and see whether it aligns normally or abnormally with your library. And that's basically what the next generation sequencing is doing, right? Whole genomic sequence is looking for the whole book of the genes, and there is plentiful of that. Your regular computer is not going to be able to store all that information, right? I usually tell the patients and to myself, okay, I've, I've got back the results of that thousand pages book, what do I do with that, right? You need the genetic computational biologist who will then com compare those misreads, right? Uh, uh, type typographic errors, if you want to put it, right? With the normal library, basically to do the spell check. What stands out abnormal, what is normal, right? And that's what is being done with a whole genomic sequence. So again, the idea behind that is that rather than test for individual gene, right, you are testing for the whole panel and trying to identify, can you identify already known mutation or something stands out? And you cannot do it on one individual, right? Because how do you know whether it's normal or abnormal? You need the family. And if it repeats in uh, the family members, specifically affected uh, family members, then you have the high accuracy that it is potentially linked to the clinical manifestations of the disease. Make sense? And you will also hear, so that is the whole genome sequence, right? Whole genome sequence is huge. It's still very expensive, though the prices are uh, exponentially going uh, down. What is more frequently done is testing for the whole exomal sequence. So that is a part of the gene. It actually is a small part of the gene, less than 10%, but it does most of the coding, right? Less expensive, more uh, accessible, still done more on the research basis rather than on the commercial basis, but very, very rapidly, again, specifically in the pediatric movement disorders uh, clinics, there is a shift from single gene testing to that whole panel sequencing for multiple reasons, technical uh, advances, cost going uh, down. So that is my two words. I'm not a clinical geneticist, so, but this is my very brief overview of genetics. Uh, so, and now we're moving into the management, right? And that's your major question. What can you do for us? Uh, and I always preempt uh, the discussion with non-pharmacological management. I will overview pharmacological uh, therapy, and unfortunately, we have not made much progress. I'll talk briefly about botulinum toxin injections for those for whom it's appropriate. We have two slides on baclofen, and will not talk about surgical management. Uh, so with that uh, said, non-pharmacological management, I cannot reinforce how important is 
are all the how important are all the aspects of it and first and foremost education and counseling i don't need to tell the families who have the condition in their family how important that is how many questions you have so seek the answers to your questions physical therapy occupational therapy speech therapy genetic counseling that we talked about social work uh, intervention whether that's for the child for the school adaptation whether it is for the adult for the work adaptation all those services are available and obviously I don't need to tell to people sitting in this room that support groups have very important uh, role in your adaptation to living with uh, the condition. And for the family members, no, would you? So let's move on into the discussion of botulinum toxin uh, efficacy. So FDA approved for cervical dystonia and blepharospasm, however, indicated and being used for any type of focal uh, dystonias. Uh, two toxins are commercially available uh, worldwide, including United States is toxin A and toxin B. So, and this is the chronology of the development of uh, the toxins. So first of all, it was toxins were identified in the late 19th century, became commercially, became tested for uh, neurological indications in 1978. Actually, Dr. Scott was ophthalmologist and first tested it for strabismus and then for blepharospasm. Uh, and then the first commercialization of toxins was in 1989, it was botulinum toxin A, known under the brand name of Botox, and that was the first toxin approved, and for the next 10 years, the commercial approval for the toxin was restricted, actually, to strabismus and blepharospasm, despite the fact that all of us were injecting it for other types of dystonia, and then it became uh, FDA approved for cervical dystonia at the time with another strain of toxin A became available, and as of today, we have four different toxins commercially available for management of dystonias. They still belong to two different strains, and I'll give you a very quick overview of underlying pharmacology. So first of all, what is botulinum toxin? Obviously, it is a toxin, right? It is a toxin pr produced by Clostridium botulinum uh, uh, spores. It is a gram-positive bacilli, right? So, and it is the toxin produced by it. Uh, immunologically, there are seven distinct forms, and these are the number, they are labeled by the letters, and commercially available are two. Some other have been tested, F has been tested, E has been tested, but really it was not shown to be sufficiently long acting uh, and efficacious. So released from uh, the bacteria, that's what I usually tell the patients, that's not where we get it. We don't get it from bad canned food or from uh, honey sitting uh, in your drawer for a long time. Obviously it is commercialized and very stringently controlled. So how does that work? So toxin A in normal uh junction, right, connection of the nerve to uh, the muscle. Uh, there is production of acetylcholine from the nerve ending, and that is the chemical that connects the nerve to the muscle and gives the signal work, con constri constrict or start acting, right? So normally it is an essential chemical connection that makes you move, right? In the conditions that are associated with excessive activity of the muscle, what the toxin allows is to block, to reduce that propagation of the connection because the toxin works over here. It blocks the release of the acetylcholine from that what we call presynaptic uh, membrane, so it reduces the connectivity translating into reduced ability of the muscle to spasm, right? So it reduces that overactivity of the muscle. It doesn't do anything with the nerve signals, right? Or with the brain signals. It doesn't do anything with the etiology, with the course of the dystonia. It is purely symptomatic therapy, but highly efficacious for any type of focal dystonia provided that you can treat that that way. And I usually tell the patients, if your type of focal dystonia uh, is amendable to toxin, it is much more efficacious for me to try to do it with a toxin injection than to give you systemic medications amendable, uh, associated with systemic side effects of sedation and everything else, right? So this is the mechanism of action of dystonia. This is the first uh, toxin that was uh, approved, uh, as I have said, uh, Botox. So frequently you will hear the physicians kind of way ingrained in our brain that toxin, when I talk about toxin, I frequently 
treatment would say Botox, kind of one for all, but again, this is a particular strain of botulinum toxin A, and as I have said, um, in uh, 89, uh, in 99, uh, the botulinum toxin B was approved, which is known under the brand name of uh, Maya Block, right? And the difference, so that is the only toxin that belongs to a different class, right? B class. And the significance of that, if someone has developed resistance to the toxin, to toxin A, this is a different strain, right? You can legitimately switch from one to the other, though it is approved for primary management of cervical uh, dystonia as well. The other new toxins, um, Three other, uh, three altogether, all belong to the class A. You cannot exchange; they're not exchangeable because while they chemically belong to the same class, they were manufactured differently. So, from the FDA standpoint, they're not interchangeable. We cannot inject, you say, with uh, Botox on one session, uh, with uh, Xeamine on another uh, session, and say they're exactly the same. They chemically belong to the same chemical structure, but they're not interchangeable based uh, on uh, production uh, policies. What is the duration uh, of uh, benefit of toxin? Majority of the studies indicated 12, sometimes 16 weeks, and it really depends on the type of uh, body part that is being injected, cervical dystonia, blepharospasm, arm uh, dystonia, leg uh, dystonia, and what are the potential side effects? Side effects are obviously side injection specific. If you're injecting around the eyes, you will be concerned about dryness of the eye, probably droopiness of their eyelid, uh, weakness of ability to open uh, the eyes. If you're injecting in the neck, you would be concerned potentially of the risk of weakness of the muscle that you've injected. Always you, uh, talk to the patients about the risk of swallowing problems when you inject anyway in the area of uh, the neck and so on. If you inject the arm and if you're targeting particular muscle, weakness of that muscle, the good news about that is that even if you develop the weakness, it doesn't mean that the physician has overdosed you. That means that your muscles probably are more sensitive to it and that weakness will go away because the effect of the toxin is not permanent and that's the reason why we need to ask the patients to come in uh, every three months on average for the repeated uh, injections. Now, I purposefully am not spending much time on uh, toxin therapy because toxins, while extremely uh, effective for management of focal dystonias, have been out there for a while, so you're familiar with them, right? And aside from expansion of the types of uh, different toxins. We really have not brought new knowledge uh, lately. And now let's move on to the medical treatment of dystonias. In majority of cases, um, medical therapy will be focused on patients with more generalized manifestations where we cannot effectively treat their symptoms with the focal uh, toxin injections. Again, uh, systemic therapy might be essential and necessary for those patients, but I repeat it again, if there is focal isolated dystonia that amendable to the toxin in injection, the benefit versus risk ratio definitely is on the side of the focal injections. And we talked already about up the reason for levodopa uh, therapy, uh, largely to exclude the potential uh, uh, diurnal, dystonia with diurnal fluctuations. Anticholinergics have been the oldest management for uh, dystonias, actually came into play in the 19th uh, century uh, by the French neurologist Charcot, uh, both for management of uh, uh, Parkinson's disease and dystonias and still specifically in kids is a very important part of management of uh, manif generalized manifestations of dystonia. The reason why not in adults, adults have much lower threshold for uh, side effects associated with uh, these medications. Then antispasmodics, uh, Oops, sorry, uh, baclofen, uh, both systemic oral and uh, pump, clonazepam as quote unquote generally uh, relaxing uh, medication, and a couple types of dopaminergic therapies that I will very quickly go over. So anticholinergics, we still don't exactly understand the mechanism of action. There is a number of imaging studies and actually um, Ann Arbor is doing very exciting work on imaging of the cholinergic uh, system, both in Parkinsonian and dystonic says to have better understanding what is the role of that cholinergic system in development of the uh, symptoms. Again, 
can be very efficacious for management of dystonic symptoms. The major drawback is potential risk of side effects, specifically in more adult uh, population. Uh, benzodiazepines, those are your clonazepam, Valium, um, medications and the like. Uh, the uh, benefit can be uh, there, again, side effects, sedation, confusion, intolerance, and again, remember that these medications could not, should not be stopped abruptly. Baclofen, another type of muscle relaxant medication and can be given systemically and has a role in selected cases as baclofen pump infusion, so smaller doses targeted directly into the spinal fluid, so lower dose, higher concentration in your target area can be indicated with very selected cases because obviously, again, it doesn't treat the dystonia course of the condition, it treats the symptoms, it relaxes the muscles, and if relaxes the muscles in the part of the body that is not affected by dystonia, can impact walking, can impact breathing, can impact other things that you cannot afford to be impacted. So very, so this is the system that is being implanted, so it has a role in very selected, carefully selected uh, cases. And now dopaminergic uh, therapy in uh, dystonias, and the reason for, so that I mean, usually you hear about its role in conjunction with Parkinson's disease. So this is the system. This is my very simplified slide of dopaminergic system connection, right? So in Parkinson's disease, there is deprivation of dopamine production over here. In dystonic conditions, the way we understand, there might be hyperactivity here. So the treatment that we use actually is, and that's where the role of dopamine blocking agents uh, comes in, is to reduce the activity of the system by blocking these chemical uh, connections. And that's where the prototypic medications like Heldol and the like could be useful. The problem with them is that you block the system, it resprouts, it becomes more sensitive. So you block it, it comes back again. You block it, it comes back again. So actually, if we use those medications, we prefer to act on the presynaptic system and reduce the release of dopamine rather than block its conduction. And tetrabenazine, for some of you who have been exposed to that, is pretty much the only medication in that uh, class. And without going more into the, my last slide, and I cannot, re and I cannot uh, withhold putting that, Dr. Bega, are you gonna talk about cannabis? Okay, so I have just one slide. You will hear more about cannabis, right? Because inevitably that question will come in the questions and answers session, right? So the good news are that in dystonia, we actually do have the literature to communicate to you. And Dr. Bega will expand uh, on that. This is the meta-analysis uh, of published uh, literature in different movement disorders. And with that, uh, I will close my talk on uh, medical management of dystonias. Majority of patients require combination therapy from a Ecological options are limited. And just today in the morning, I've done literature search on PubMed. There were 240 hits for dystonia on clinical trials and essentially no new pharmacological intervention. Majority, majority of those were surgical management, botulinum toxin, both of them are extremely exciting. But we definitely need to do better with uh, the medical uh, management. And that is a good segue in Dr. Patel's uh, presentation. And with that, that uh, said, I will conclude my talk and uh, again appreciate the invitation and very much appreciate the being able to reconnect uh, with the foundation. And these are the collaborators uh, that are working at Northwestern and uh, other collaborations uh, in our work. Thank you very much. <laughs>